Thanks for listening to our online messages from Calvary Chapel North Shore on the island of Kauai. Stay up to date on content and our events on our website, calvarychapelnorthshore.com and on Instagram at CCNS Kauai. If you'd like to donate to our ministry, you can do so on our website. Now let's dive into the word. 1 Timothy, right after 2 Thessalonians. I'm excited about this. So next month, February, is the month of unity. That's our theme. This month, it's commitment. So January, our theme for this month is commitment, committing ourselves to the Lord, committing ourselves to God like never before. And with that commitment comes knowing the Word of God, committing yourself to being in the Word, committing yourself to praying more, committing yourself to serving God more and serving others. And so I entitled the message today, Sound Doctrine. It's so important for us to have sound doctrine because there's so much stuff floating out there. We're going to be looking at verses uh, 1 through 11 this morning, but we're going to start out by reading verses 1 through 7. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor giving heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from unfeigned faith, sincere faith, from which some have strayed, having turned aside to idle talk or vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Father, we... um, Plead with you right now, Lord God, to give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit says to us, to understand the difference between sound doctrine and phony doctrine. Lord, would you give us a hunger to know our word, the word that you've entrusted us with, that we may be ready to have an answer for every man. So bless this time. Open our hearts and our minds and our ears. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Well, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus are oftentimes referred to as the pastoral epistles. And so you might be here today and you're like saying, well, I'm not a pastor. I guess I don't have to be here. Let me know when you get to the next book. Um, You need to be here. And whether you like it or not, you're a priest. And In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, We are, as believers, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We are a special, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. So every one of you is a pastor, according to the Word of God. Kings and priests, He made us. And so with that, you have been placed in this world for such a time as this. So you say, well, I'm a contractor, I'm a teacher, I'm a waiter, I'm a martial artist, I'm a surfer, I'm whatever, you're a fireman, a, a policeman. No, you're a pastor disguised as those things. Because God has put you, whether it's a fireman, a contractor, or a teacher, He's put you into that arena to be a light that shines bright for him to lead other people that are do the same job that you do to the lord jesus christ to bring them from darkness to the light and that's why you're there now maybe you don't like your job i get that but god's got you there for a reason so maybe fulfill the reason and god will move you to the next job okay i thought you'd get a little more excited about that but okay Let's move forward. God wants to use you. God took a man like Saul of Tarsus and turned him into a nuclear weapon for Christ. 
And here we're introduced to this kid, Timothy. Who is Timothy? Well, Timothy was someone that was influenced by Paul on his first missionary journey when he went through the area of Lystra and Derby, And Timothy lived there with his mom and his grandma, who used to teach him the Scriptures. Now, his mother and his grandma were Jews. They were Jews, but his dad was a Greek. And so, when Paul was there in Lystra the first time, he was preaching, he was sharing the Gospel. Uh, him and Barnabas had prayed over a guy, he got healed. And the whole town was calling them, you know, Zeus and Hermes. These, these guys are gods. And they brought an ox to slaughter and to, uh, to dedicate to them. And, and Paul and Barnabas are like, stop, stop, don't do this. We're not gods. And so they said, okay, then kill them. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like the triumphal entry. One day they're screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, God save us. And three days later, crucify them. The crowd's fickle. So they dragged him outside of the city, they rocked him, they stoned him, left him for dead, and God revived him, and he got up and he went back in the city. How do you stop a guy like that? What was driving him? A commitment to Jesus. A commitment to one that gave him everlasting life. Paul was somebody that understood the value of his salvation. I think a lot of Christians today don't understand the full value of their salvation. Paul was so committed to serve God. This no doubt made an impact on Timothy and his mom and his grandma. And so when Paul and Silas came through the second time, they came to this area and they came encounter with Timothy and he had a good report of un amongst the people as a good godly man and they brought Timothy on board. And Timothy became this very special right-hand person to the Apostle Paul. And they had a unique relationship. And it would be at the end of Paul's life that Paul would say there was no one like-minded like me than Timothy. And Timothy was special. Uh, Paul knew that Timothy needed encouragement, as we do. He was sort of a timid Timmy. <laughs> I mean, he... he, he we're seeing here that he encourages them to remain in Ephesus. Why? Because he was ready to dig out. And sometimes we need encouragement when things are going rough. And we need to hear from God. You need to hang tight. I'll see you through this. Um, he said to Timothy, don't let people despise you for your youth. And right now, as this letter was written, Timothy was probably in his mid-30s. And... In those days, if you were under 40, you were considered a youth. I like this book. So, I mean, I mean, if you're from 40 to 50, I guess you're a teenager. And if you're in your 60s like me, I'm a young adult. So that's pretty cool. And Paul would say, hey, don't let those despise you because of your youth. Because Paul had put him in this position in Ephesus to make sure everything would go right, that they would teach sound doctrine, and things were getting tough, and he had to encourage him to stay. Now, we know that uh, he also had stomach issues, whether it was from anxiety or just a bad case of Caesar's revenge over there. I don't know what. But Paul also encouraged him to not just drink water anymore, but drink a little wine for your stomach's sake because it would kill the bacterias that were no doubt floating around in those days. And so Timothy was a, a man after God's heart and very special to Paul and Paul bringing him into the ministry he had done something very unique with Timothy that he didn't do with Titus so we look at these so-called pastor epistles first and second Timothy and Titus and we saw that Paul circumcises Timothy because wherever Paul went he went to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles so he went into the synagogue first and he knew that if those Jews knew Timothy was with them and he was part Jew because of his mom, that they wouldn't accept anything he had to say unless he was circumcised. So Paul circumcises Timothy so that he could become all things to all men that they might win some. Timothy didn't need to be circumcised to be sa saved, but Paul thought it would be easier for him to join him and to navigate through the synagogues all around if he was so when it came to Titus 
and these Christian Jews were demanding Titus be circumcised, Paul said, no way. His dad's a Gentile. Mom's a Gentile. Ain't going to happen. It's not about the circumcision of the flesh. It's about the circumcision of the heart. You're saved by faith and faith alone. Not by the law. Not by circumcision. Not by baptism. Not by this or that. It's Jesus only. And so, the importance of knowing your Bible and teaching sound doctrine. So the first verse, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Now you hear that, you're kind of thinking, I thought this is Timothy, his son in the faith. That's a little harsh. I mean, he's kind of going off. The commandment of God. I'm an apostle by the commandment of God. He knows that this letter is going to be read to the church. And so he establishes you know, it's funny, when you see him writing to other places, it's, it's, it's an apostle by the will of God, but here he says, by the commandment of God. Do you know God not only wants you to be saved, but he wants to give you something to do? Did you know every one of you have a calling on your life? And you may say, I, I can't be used by God. Well, um, God can do a lot with a little. And if you're willing, because he's not going to force you, he's going to do great things in your life. And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, I command you to do this. Steve, I want you in the ministry. John, I want you in the ministry. Go. And he's probably speaking like that to you right now. There's something he wants you to do that you've been hesitating doing. And, and God's just like, quit messing around. Go do it. Pray that you have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. He says to Timothy, a true son in the faith. Paul had a very special bond with this young man. They were like-minded. They were on fire for Jesus. He goes on to say, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. And here we see that normal greeting of grace and peace but there's a word added mercy now when he writes to the churches he always says grace and peace and it's always in that order why because you can't experience the peace of god till you've experienced the grace of god it's by grace that you're saved not of yourself not of works it's a gift from god and once you've experienced the grace of god then you you experience the peace i think it's romans 5 1 Wherefore, we are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's important. So when he writes to churches, he always says grace and peace. But when he writes these, these pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, he inserts also mercy. Why? Because pastors need mercy. It ain't an easy job. Somebody always loves me. Somebody always hates me. Some people are happy with me. Some people are disturbed by me. It's not easy. Not everything goes just wonderful. Ministry's hard. And people are hard. And they, uh, well, we'll just keep going. <laughs> I need mercy. I need your prayers. What's mercy? Mercy. Not getting what you deserve. What's grace? Grace is getting something you don't deserve. So let's say um, Josh right here. Hi, Josh. He calls me up. He wants to borrow my power washer, my pressure washer. He's got a big job to do. He's got to do these driveways, a big estate, the sidewalks, and he's got to pressure wash the, the house because he's going to paint it. So he needs to borrow my pressure washer for um, about a week. So I go, sure, no problem. I give it to him. He's busy working day after day after day. And about three days in, uh, he didn't check the oil, so he, he blows up my engine. And what's the right thing for Josh to do? Well, to replace my power washer. But he comes to me and he says, hey, I blew up your engine. I'm really sorry. I'll replace it. And I say to him, Josh, you know what? Don't worry about it. You don't have to replace it. That's mercy. And, and grace would be if I said, you know, Josh, let me tell you something. Why do, not only do you not have to replace my power washer, but I'm going to take you to Guntaro's tonight for a sushi dinner as a treat for blowing up my engine. <laughs> That's grace. And 
And I want to say this about peace. That we can have peace with God, but so many Christians don't have the peace of God. Because they fail to trust the Lord in their situation. You're a child of God. He loves you. You may go through a rough time right now, but He's got your hand. And only the peace of God will give you a peace that passes all understanding that when you're in the midst of the heaviest thing in your life, you can just say, well, Lord, I know you got this. I'm going to hang on and ride it through because I know you're good and that your desires for me are good. In verse 3, he says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia to remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that, te- that they would teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables or endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. And so he urges him to remain because why? He was ready to dig out. Have you ever been just so like overwhelmed that you were ready to quit something and God was telling you to stay there? Keep going? Remain? Do you have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying? Or is it just so much all about you that God can't reach you? Even though you're born again, you're saved, and He's trying to talk to you, and it's like, la, 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 I want to do my own thing. Or are you somebody that God can say, go, and you go? Or God could say, stay, and you're like, I don't understand, just stay, and you stay. You've got to know your, your Bible. You've got to know His intimate desires for you. It's all right here. But if you don't read it, how are you going to know it? Where are you going to get your comfort? You've got to study to show yourself approved. Rightly dividing the Word. It's so important. Learning how to hear the Holy Spirit speak to you. I remember in 1999, we were living here. We just had another boy and my wife wanted to go back to the mainland and I felt the Lord say go and we packed it up and we moved and we went back to San Clemente and as I was flying in we took a red eye and as I was flying in I saw all the lights at LA I just started to weep and I felt the Lord say I have something for you to do, but this ain't where you're staying. And uh, we got there. We were there six months. And God had us there for a reason to minister to certain people that needed that ministering too. But also, God had this church in mind that we were supposed to start, but the problem He had with me was I had no grace to be a pastor. I was very rigid, I was legalistic, I was harsh. I was just into just slicing dice and cutting people up with the Word of God and, (laughs) you know, look at you. And God had to settle me down and teach me grace. He put me under a man in San Clemente that was so much about grace that um, to give me that balance that I needed. And then after six months, I felt the Lord say, go back to Kauai, but that would be impossible because like today, inflation was super high in 1999 and there wasn't any real estate for sale. There wasn't any places for rent like right now. And back then, think about this, over 20 years ago, rents for homes was going three to 5,000 just for a home. It's much like today. And there was no way. And my wife had worked in real estate and timeshare before we left. She had all the inside connects and we couldn't get a place. So I'm like, Lord, you said we're going back. What's going on? And then we got a phone call from some folks that used to live here that were now in Mission Viejo. And they said, you know what? We've been meaning to come see you guys. Uh, I'm sorry we haven't connected with you. I know you've been there six months and we'd like to come see you. And we go, well, we're actually going to move. And they're like, well, where are you moving to? We're going Kauai. And they go, do you have a house? We go, no, there aren't any. And they go, well, we just bought a house in Princeville. And we were going to rent it out till we moved there. And I was like, really? How much is the rent? 
And they were like, can you handle 800? I'm like, that's you, Lord. And they were Christians. They could have got three, five thousand dollars a month. They they gave it to us for eight hundred and we went. And it was right after that we started this church. But God had to teach me grace. And sometimes he's gonna tell you to go when you don't think it's right, and sometimes he's gonna tell you to stay when you don't think it's right. Because he has you here for such a time as this. The importance of teaching sound doctrine there in verse 3 is because wolves were creeping in. And Paul had warned the church in Ephesus that this thing, this very thing would happen. And so now he's warning Timothy to take a stand and not allow false doctrine to creep into the church. And this is something that every church has to deal with. There are always those that are going to come in, they're going to slip in, and they're going to try to infiltrate their doctrine at the risk of destroying people and teaching lies that aren't biblical. And there's a lot of false doctrine out there. And unfortunately, Christians would rather listen to sermons than read their Bible And if they're not listening to the right guy, they get led astray. Because you should know this Bible enough that when somebody says something wrong, red flag, you're like questioning it. (laughs) And here's what you always say, show me it in the Bible. If they can't, disregard it. It's a fable. It's a myth. you got to be careful. Paul, when he was there with them, he warned them. He said in Acts 20, verse Uh, 25 he says and indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more he was going to leave them they would never see him again therefore I testified to you this day I am innocent of the blood of men what does that mean that means he has shared the gospel with everybody he's come in contact with and if they refuse Jesus Christ it's not on his hands it's on their head that's pretty cool Can we say that? He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw you, draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you every night and day with tears. Crazy. Strong warning. And now these things are happening. And he's telling Timothy, he's trying to urge Timothy, stop it. And that's the job of a pastor. When when we find out false doctrines coming to the church, I have to go up to that person. I have to confront them. And if they listen and you can reason with them, you've gained a brother. But if they don't, then I got to send them out. And this is where people don't have grace and mercy for the pastor. They're like, oh, pastor, where's your grace? You kicked that guy out of the church. I've been dealing with that guy for a year and he's not listening and he continues on his campaign and we can't have it. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, it says, For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside to fables. That's the world that we're living in right now, you guys. We're living in a world that the church, the so-called Christian church, people just want to be entertained. They want to be entertained. They want their ears tickled. Tell me what I want to hear. And when you get a church that's all about entertainment and tickling the ears of individuals, guess what? They don't teach the whole counsel of God. They don't go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Nobody's getting away with anything. Not even me. The sword comes out, it cuts you. It comes right back, it cuts me. 
I get all cut up during the sermon. Maybe you do, but I know I do as I preach the sermon because God's dealing with me. And so he warns them the importance of sound doctrine and the teaching of the Word. And he says, don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies. If you don't know the Word of God, you're going to be taken in. You're going to be duped. Somebody's going to come up and they're going to say, Jesus Christ, they're going to say some words that, you, that resonate with you from the Bible, but if you don't know the Bible, they'll add their lies in with truths and deceive you. And I hate it when I have to point these things out, but I have to do it for the sake of a healthy church. Some of the biggest fables will be those people that will knock on your door or ride up on their bikes to your door. They're Jehovah Witness. They're Mormons. They are not Christians, guys. I love them. They are the sweetest, kindest people ever. They outdo us in works. But they don't know Jesus Christ. They worship something else. Because to them, Jesus Christ was a created being. That's not my Jesus. My Jesus is not the brother of Lucifer. He's not Michael the archangel. And they'll knock on the door and they say, listen, you can be a god on your own planet one day. That's not what I read in the Bible. And I look at these guys and I say, how do you get that from just reading the Bible? In love. I say it in love. I go, all the stuff you're telling me, you never would have got that from just reading the Bible. You're reading something that man wrote. Sound doctrine is important. He talks about genealogies. Why? Because, you know, the Jews were really into genealogies. And so you got a lot of converted Jews to Christianity, but they hang on. You know how you hang on to your stuff? You know, hey, I met so-and-so years ago. Yeah, well, I met so-and-so, right? You know, genealogies were really important to them. And it would determine how you would kind of set in position in the synagogue by your genealogies, right? So if somebody comes up and goes, hey, how you doing? Oh, good. Well, what's your genealogy? Oh, well, you know, our family is a long line of murderers and thieves that kind of trace back to Judas Iscariot. Oh, well, what's your genealogy? Oh, we, us? Our, wow, our genealogy goes all the way back to David. King David. I mean, who are you going to give the home fellowship to, right? And what Paul's trying to say is, listen, it, it's not about that. Nobody's better than anybody else in the kingdom of God. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, man or woman, bond or free. We're one in Christ. I'll tell you, ladies, Jesus was the best thing that ever came along for you. You had no rights until Jesus came. And he set that all straight. We're no longer under the curse. We've been set free and we're free indeed. And so he's going to go in to talk about the law. And the purpose of the law was to prove to us that we're sinners and we need to be saved. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you're born again. Your new creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I say that because a lot of people are caught up in this, this uh, generational curse thing. Forget about it. The only ones that are cursed are unbelievers. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you're no longer cursed. You're a child of God. You're forgiven. In... Um, Verse 5, he says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from unfeigned faith or sincere faith. Does that describe you? Are you someone known for your love for others? Are you someone that's known for a pure heart? A good conscience, a clean conscience, sincere faith. Does that describe you? If it doesn't, let God work in your life. Let God change you. Don't, don't just cop out and say, well, it's just the way I am. Stop it. God's changing you from glory to glory. Let Him have His way. Stop blaming everybody else. Stop blaming God. Start taking a little ownership and let God change you from glory to glory. We all have a conscience. Unbelievers, believers, we all have a conscience. God's blessed every man, believing or non-believing. 
every man and woman has been blessed with a conscience, which means you, uh, even when you're not saved, you know what's right and wrong. Your conscience tells you. Now, we hear of a good conscience in the Bible. We hear of a pure conscience. I like that. Wow. I want that. <laughs> and then we hear it of a seared conscience. What's a seared conscience? That's somebody that sins so much it doesn't even phase them. And that can happen to even Christians. You remember when you got saved and you turned away from the world and, and then you went back and did something you used to do and you were so broken, you're like, oh my gosh, Lord, I can't believe I did that. And you're like weeping, I, Lord, I, I, forgive me. And you ask for forgiveness and you repent and He forgives you and He sets you on your feet again. You're like, that'll never happen again. And then it happens again. And then you weep and you repent and God forgives you. And you're like, Lord, it's never, I'm never going to do that again. And then all of a sudden you do it again. But now every time you do it, you're kind of like not weeping so much, and then you get to a point where you don't even shed a tear, and you're, then you're just like, oh, yeah, I did that. Yeah, forgive me. It's not even true repentance. You're, you become seared. But the good news is God can still forgive that if you're willing to repent with a true heart. We don't want a seared conscience. Sincere, unfeigned Faith produces in the heart of a believer love, a pure heart, and a good conscience. In verse 6, he says, From which some, having strayed, have turned aside to vain jangling, idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. So you ever been around somebody that doesn't even know what they're talking about, but they say it with such authority? you kind of question yourself? That's why you need to know your Bible. So what was happening here was they were trying to bring people back under the law. They had no understanding of the truth of what God had really done, and now they're trying to say, Jesus and. You can't do that. Jesus did it all at the cross. Be very careful if you talk to anybody who says, well, you got to be saved by faith in Jesus and as soon as you hear that and, you're like, that's not my Jesus. Because you'll hear that. You'll hear and keeping the law and being circumcised and being baptized and being part of our church and using this Bible and having this kind of music and this and that. No, that's not my Jesus. It's saved by Jesus Christ by faith and nothing. Because if you don't believe that, then now you're saying that when Jesus was hanging on the cross and said it was finished, that he lied. Jesus didn't lie. He said it was finished. And these people that try to bring you back under the law and the bondage of law are saying that what Jesus did was not enough and that we need to come in and finish the good work. You can't do anything. You can't add anything to what Jesus did on the cross. You just need to receive what He's offering you. Amen? Don't let anyone bring you back under the law. So then you say, well, then what's the purpose of the law? Well, it's to convince you that you're a sinner. It's the schoolmaster. And if you understand what the schoolmaster is telling you and you come to faith in Jesus Christ, the law did its job. You're not under the law. You're under grace. You're under love. The law of the Spirit. Different. But if you reject Jesus Christ, then the law becomes a taskmaster. And it's brutal. And there's no hope. And you'll die in your sins and be separated forever. So, if you say the law and grace, what's the difference? Well, let me, let me just say this. The law doesn't love. Grace does. The law doesn't forgive. Grace does. The law doesn't show mercy. Grace shows mercy. And the law doesn't give life because we can't keep it. Only grace gives life. Don't get me wrong, the law is perfect. It's just. It's holy. The problem is we can't keep it. Romans 10.1 says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. 
For I bear them record that they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Is that good news or what? Maybe this is just all for me. I'm having fun. I love this stuff. In verse 8, he says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. If you understand the purpose of the law to convince you that you're a sinner, then you're going to come to Jesus Christ because you know you need a Savior. It's done its job. And now I'm no longer under the law of Moses, but I'm under the law of the Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me, and now I'm being guided by Jesus Himself, and I'm doing a lot more stuff than I ever could have done on my own, and I'm keeping the commandments more than ever before because the power of Christ is the one that's driving me. Galatians 3.21 says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, Truly, righteousness would have been by the law, but the Scripture has confined all are under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only answer. That's the only thing that will save you is Jesus Christ. Listen, before we knew Jesus, we were all dead in our sins and trespasses. Amen? Amen? We were all dead in our sins and trespasses. Let me read you something um, from Romans 3, verse 10. Check this out. This is how we know we're all dead in our sins and trespasses. Listen. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. This is B.C., before Christ. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. Did you know God came after you? Did you know that? The Holy Spirit was calling, the Father was drawing, and Jesus went after you. Scriptures tell you that. You didn't seek Him. He sought you. Man, that's a great God. Then it goes on to say, they've all turned aside. They they have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, and with their tongues they have practiced deceit, the poison of asps under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So don't, any, but don't let anybody try to drag you back under the law. Jesus finished the work on the cross, and you just come to Him by grace. And then let the Holy Spirit guide you. And you'll do a lot better than those guys that are trying to bring themselves back under the bondage of law. How frustrating. Trying to keep something you can't. Now, we're doing better, aren't we? But, wow. And so he goes on there in verse 8, and we'll look at our last verses 8 through 11 today. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. Did you get that? Are you righteous because of the blood of Jesus in your life? Are you born again? Law is not for you. It's for the unrighteous. It's for the lawless and the rebellious, the insubordinate, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers. For fornicators and sodomites and kidnappers, man stealers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there are any th- other things contrary to sound doctrine. So Paul's saying, if there's anything I didn't list there that you know about, put it on there. <laughs> According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, 
was committed to my trust. And so he goes through this list. Now, we've seen other lists in the Bibles where he talks about all these things. <laughs> and then he, he talks about murderers and fornicators and homosexuality and drug addicts and drunkards. And then he, he mentions liars and, and, and slanderers and those that cause division and gossip. And those that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's kind of scary. Well, who can be saved? Anyone that surrenders to Jesus Christ. See, because we, we go through this list. Check this list out right here. Let me, let me read it again. For, it's for the lawless. The, the law is for the lawless, the rebellious, the insubordinate, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, the profane, the murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, fornicators, sexual immorality, for sodomites, homosexuals, for kidnappers, human trafficking, and for liars and those that break promises. And you're kind of like, wait, wh wait, whoa, hold it right there. Why do you bring up liars? I mean, I thought we were just talking about horrible people. I'm just a liar. That's his point. He lists in other places slanderers, those that cause division and gossipers, all with murderers and drunkards and everything else. What's my point? There is none righteous. No, not one. You need Jesus. You say, well, that's not fair. Because I know this little old lady on the street. She's just the nicest little old lady. She's sweet. She, she doesn't harm anybody. You're telling me she's going to hell? Without Jesus, she is. She'll be the sweetest little old lady in hell. Well, why is that? Because she rejected what God was offering. You know, there's a lot of sweet people rejecting what God is offering. And, and we got to stop putting sin on levels, right? Well, I'm not like that guy. That guy's a bank robbing, murdering, drunk, drug addict, rapist. I just gossip. God says guilty. You've broken the law. I was once in uh, Chinyang Village, and there was these two Buddhists there. <laughs> and I started to kind of put myself in the area so they would talk to me. And they started talking to me and sharing me about Buddhism, and so I started sharing the Lord. And um, they started telling me, oh, we believe in Jesus. And I go, really? They're like, oh, yeah. He's a great Bodhisattva. I said, well, what's that? They go, a teacher of truth. I go, so I wonder if he wasn't teaching truth. Well, he wouldn't be one. I said, you know what Jesus said? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. They were stunned. And I started to tell them that all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and then they told me, I don't sin. They go, we don't sin. I go, that's sin right there? You're lying. <laughs> they, they said, no, we don't sin. We're without sin. And so I'm a little rebellious. So I started going back and forth with him till I really upset him. And one of them snapped at me and I go, you just sinned. <laughs> can, can I tell you something that'll probably blow your mind? And don't take this out of context. Please, church, pay attention. Nobody's going to hell for their sin. They're going because they rejected what Jesus offered them. Because you ain't going to heaven because you're sinless. You know that, don't you? You're not what you used to be, but you're not what you should be. But you only get to heaven by receiving the gift that Jesus offers you. Because he did it all, not you. And you only go to hell because you reject that gift. Don't ever reject what Jesus is offering you. Let me close with this. Sinners need a Savior. And God has put you here on Kauai, on the North Shore, for such a time as this to share the love of God with everybody that you can that they may know Jesus. And he wants to use you. And he wants you to be a light 
that shines bright for His glory, that when people see your good works, they glorify the Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Um, thank You for Your faithfulness, Lord God. Thank You for Your love and Your grace, and thank You for Your mercy. Lord, strengthen us to be the men and women that You've called us to be, to totally rely on You and not our own power, but by the power of God. And Lord, we need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit because this group's about ready to head out to the mission field. Whether it's going surfing or playing golf or going shopping or lunch, breakfast, Lord God, you're going to put them somewhere where they're going to be able to minister to somebody. And I pray they have an ear to hear you guide them. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Mm -hmm.